welcome back this is a continuation of the um, recap for p3 uh, i had covered topics up till differentiation uh, with this uh, second recap video i'm going to start off with integration and take you uh, through differential equations and the numerical solutions and so on uh, the best thing in the integration is that you must remember that all of as integration is part of a2 um so you can be asked basic integration questions such as finding the equation of the curve or finding definite integrals or you can also be asked to find areas and volumes and so on so uh make sure that you know the rules for area and volume a lot of people actually forget and that causes some trouble then uh, the first thing that i teach with integration in uh, p3 is the rules with trigonometry and exponents um, okay so those are the rules written in front of you for exponents and then for reversing this so ln x had the differential one over x so it becomes ln modulus x you can put a modulus just to be on the safe side i've never seen it matter in a question but uh, that's part of the rule then one over f of x so if you have one over a linear expression that was actually uh that would actually get into to ln f of x divided by f bar of x this only works when f of x is linear so one over x square plus two wouldn't integrate it, get integrated in the same way um uh, okay so f of x must be linear then you have integration of exponential examples you can see them some with limits um uh, that is integration of one over f of x okay i often find it easier to pull this common out the coefficient is easier when it's outside it makes calculations easier it makes plugging in limits easier and so on so that is what i generally tend to do then you have integration of trigonometric function remember that a lot of people end up making mistakes silly mistakes with signs these are written in your formula sheet so if you're confused about the signs just make sure that you go back to the formula sheet and see what's happening so sin x is minus cos x uh mine uh cos x is sin x and sec square x is tan x any other integration apart from these three will require some uh identities to help you solve them these are two other uh integrations that you should know um although they are derived they are not in the formula sheet this these are two that you need to remember um the, they are derived through integration by recognition and we'll cover that in a bit okay then you have like i told you any other integration that isn't part of the rules needs an identity uh for the integration to happen so notice here that i've used an identity tan square theta is replaced with sec square theta minus one so all the identities are relevant make sure that you use them properly you will come across direct questions that ask you to do so okay then there are lots of questions that merge together trigonometry and integration where you have to first you know prove something and then integrate it remember that uh again any other powers will not get integrated you will have to find a replacement for that and then integrate it the most problematic part that i've seen a lot of students struggle with is this integration of cos square x or sine square x or cos square 2x or sine square 2x for that matter so remember that this double angle identity will always come in handy you should remember the reshuffled one that if you have this identity cos 2x equals to 2 cos square x minus 1 then if i make cos square x the subject it becomes half plus half cos 2x similarly sine square x becomes half minus half cos 2x this identity again operates in multiples so you could have 4x and 2x you need to remember this whenever you are integrating this no other identity will work this cannot be integrated like that don't integrate it with the power rule that's wrong <clears throat> if you do it you get a straight zero so make sure that you remember this lots of questions on this okay uh that's proving and all those things there are actually lots of questions on this part of the syllabus okay 
okay then you have integration by recognition this is something that i specifically teach uh some people may merge it with integration of algebra and so on but what i tell my students is that whenever the differential of the denominator is appearing in the numerator that is when you start off with recognition you say that if there's an expression that has a denominator when the differential is there in the numerator then the numerator vanishes and it only becomes ln f of x why because integration is defined as a reverse process of differentiation there's no other way um, so if it, the differential looks like this its integral would be this so remember that if in case the differential is not specifically visible there's a number problem that uh, you wanted let's say you wanted 6x squared plus 10x but the numerator had 3x squared plus 5x you could multiply with 2 but you can't simply change the expression you need to multiply by 2 and divide with a 2 outside so it's so it technically cancels out the number remember that you cannot adjust a variable here you couldn't have said let's say this was 3x plus 5 you couldn't have said that i should multiply it with 1 over x and x y because you could not adjust with a variable that variable needs to be integrated before it can come outside the integral so only numbers can be adjusted this way this topic is specifically there in your past papers so make sure that you understand what is happening here and i told you that tan to tan x and cortex are derived they are derived through integration by recognition you can also learn uh, these formulas and they make sort of your life easier so these are the formulas that i wrote down above as well you can learn them and they make your life easier there was a specific question on integration by recognition on its own then this is something that came up in the 2020 syllabus and uh, it sort of has gotten tricky there were some very tricky questions on tan inverse of x uh, so you need to know the differentiation and integration of tan inverse of x so that's the differentiation that's written for you in case you have another angle not just x you have a function of x then it becomes tan inverse of uh, 1 plus f of x whole square into f bar of x uh lots of questions here as well uh, some people ask me how it's derived so that's how it's derived you can see the derivation here you don't need to know the derivation i think there was a very old past paper question when this wasn't part of the syllabus that they asked you to derive uh, and they sort of gave you hints so it's derived to implicit differentiation and you sort of get your final answer very quickly then i've done questions in this okay then if i want to do this process in reverse it's it's uh the reverse process is basically one over one plus x square integrates to tan inverse of x but you can't won't simply just have one plus x square in the denominator sometimes you're going to have other numbers that are added so let's say a square was added so this becomes then and that one over a tan inverse of x over a and if you have something that looks like this then it becomes one over b tan inverse of bx plus c so you can see a question here you can see another question here you can see questions that have don't have um you know perfect squares so i use roots instead instead that is how it works this is a merger between the two rules i written somewhere yeah that's where it's written you can note this down as well okay only the first rule would be written in your formula sheet none of the others so you need to remember these a's and b's wherever they appear uh there is no other source of this information okay then this was an interesting question from the specimen paper try to look at it understand what it says there is a bit of integration by parts involved here as well um, that's something that i teach later uh, i will come across it and i sort of come back and you know sort of taught this in the class so that's why it's here uh, but i'm going to talk about it okay so that's integration by trigonometry and exponentials the next that i teach is integration by parts integration by parts is basically the product rule of integration um so when you are uh, sort of doing the product rule of integration you use a um, mnemonic or acronym whatever you want to call it i late i late um means inverse trigonometric logarithmic algebraic trigonometric and exponential it tells you a particular order for you to 
uh, sort of use what how do you use that order uh, whenever you get an expression that has two different uh, expressions uh, two different types of expressions in it so one of them is uh, you see algebraic the other one is trigonometric so you circle algebraic and trigonometric the first in this order is called u the second in this order is called v dash then that's the formula for integration by parts v u minus integral of v u dash again there are various ways of doing integration by parts please make sure that you're comfortable with whatever way you've learned or learn a particular way if you haven't run, learned that already so then you go on and integrate sometimes it takes two levels of integration so for example in this case it takes two levels of integration so i go through integration by part once and i realize that again i've ended up with an expression that requires another integration by parts so i'm going to do that again you see i leave this area blank why because i know that this part remains the same so i bring it back at the end and then i put it there uh, if there are limits i apply the limits if there are just uh, constants i just put out the constant then some more questions i get my students to try this in class okay so one of the uh, things that is there is integral of ln x ln x gets integrated with integration by parts only there is no direct way of integrating ln x um, uh, you are right that i don't see two different types of expressions one of them is certainly um, the logarithmic but i sort of made this one ln x and introduced an algebra where i say that one is basically x power zero so i've sort of integrated x power zero and then gotten through the same integration by parts by saying that it's two different expressions something that's not here and i'm going to write that down here is tan inverse of x if i ask you to integrate tan inverse of x that's how you also integrate you say that i first have the in i late i have i as the inverse trigonometric and i don't have anything else so i'm going to say that there's one that's algebra uh, that's going to be u and v dash so u is going to be tan inverse of x and v dash is going to be 1 so v is x u dash is 1 over 1 plus x square so i'm going to write that i'm going to say that v u minus integral of v u dash v u v u and we u dash so that is fine the other one is basically an integration by parts so i say that you put a you put a two here and a half outside to make sure that integration by recognition is occurring and then you say that this becomes half ln one plus x squared plus c so both tan inverse of x and ln x get integrated in this way uh, make sure that you know these these have appeared um, a lot of times in the formula uh, in the past papers and it's not just necessary to have tan inverse of x you could have tan inverse of 2x um, uh, if you look back up uh, into the video you will see that i integrate something called x tan inverse of x as well it works in the same way so just go back and look at it if you are confused this is a question that keeps running i don't have time to solve this um uh, i've never seen such a question on the past papers so i'm hoping it's an it's not something that you should know uh, it's higher level integration by parts so let's skip that for now i can you can watch the videos uh lecture videos where i solve them to get an idea of what's actually going on okay then some questions on integration by parts usually the first question is uh differentiation so you have the product rule or the quotient rule when you're differentiating then you have uh, the second part where you want to find the area under the curve so that's integration by parts okay that's integration by parts then i have integration by substitution now i've been asked this question a lot uh by students uh regarding integration by substitution remember that in your uh, exam the substitution will always be provided 
for you a lot of people have sent me questions that you know said uh, i we solved this through integration by substitution and we took this kind of substitution remember that all such questions will probably have another way of solving them either by recognition or or something else or partial fractions or something else um uh, i have never come across a question where i was asked to assume a substitution myself and then solve the question so the substitution will always be provided to you that's something that you should know uh when the substitution is provided to you your task is to substitute when you substitute your expression turns up in terms of theta so what is the important part then that if you are integrating something in theta you should have a d theta in front of it rather than a dx in front of it so you cannot have a dx so you start replacing dx as well how do you replace dx by differentiating your substitution you differentiate your substitution and try to make dx the subject of this sometimes it's going to end up in division sometimes it's going to end up in multiplication but uh, it is going to get replaced once you replace that only then will you come across an expression that can be integrated uh, in terms of theta so in this case it's turned out to be cos square theta now remember that i told you I, i've seen a lot of people make silly mistakes here so cos square theta gets integrated with the identity half plus half cos 2 theta and that's what i've done here so that's two questions put together into one question you're going to get six marks out of this uh, given that there are no limits but uh, you should do the entire thing correctly then okay then uh so i've integrated this in terms of theta technically what i should then do is i should you know go back and replace theta with sin inverse of x uh, but right now uh, the question doesn't have limits usually in the past papers you will find questions that have limits so more questions uh, one over x ln x now first gut feeling is uh, that why don't, don't we use integration by parts why because the question is telling you to use the substitution so you can't use integration by parts if you wanted to use integration by parts you would have done that otherwise uh, the question is open ended such questions get a little tricky because they have some identities involved as well please make sure that you understand what the question's primary objective is it's to, it's to test integration it's not to test your identities so the identities will come in handy to simplify the expression not to start off with the question so you should, your questions start off with the substitution rather than anything else some more questions okay one thing that uh, i should highlight at this point is that when you are then uh, doing a substitution you replace the expression you replace dx you need to also replace the limits now be very careful when you plug in the lower limit you will get the lower limit when you plug in the upper limit you will get the upper limit there is a possibility that that limit you won't make sense to you you'll have a lower uh, you'll have a smaller lower limit you will have a bigger lower limit and a smaller upper limit which means that your limits have been switched it's absolutely fine to have them switched it doesn't matter it won't matter on your final answer keep them switched if you randomly sort of replace them uh you will probably get a get a wrong answer at the end you will get probably end up getting a negative answer remember that if the limits are a to b and you want to switch them uh, let's say a b to a so if you want to do that yourself you need to put a negative outside as well that's what you've got to do okay then all of these questions i do a lot of questions here some of these questions put together integration by substitution and integration by parts so that was an interesting one again you see you use u equals to sin 4x to evaluate this remember that this question is about substitution do the substitution don't start uh, applying trigonometric identities it's going to get very complicated okay so that's integration by substitution the last type of integration that you then have is integration with partial fractions so again remember your partial fractions uh you need to remember the cases on your own you need to figure out when they are improper fractions or proper fractions sometimes they are not clearly visible i've seen a lot of people end up being confused with let's say give you an expression x square over 1 plus x square this comes up usually when you have a tan tan inverse and you know sort of uh, you've ended up with v u dash and you are integrating it now remember that this expression has no other way there can't be any recognition 
if you understand that this is this is actually um, an improper fraction so uh, the only way to integrate it is, is to turn this into a proper fraction so what you've got to do is you've got to divide x square with one plus x square you do the long division i'm not doing it right now it's going to make it complicated uh, on a different screen so that's what you've got to do in order to in order for you to be able to integrate this okay so this question has come up so uh, i'm explicitly stating it out then once you've done your partial fractions you end up with expressions like this my general gut feeling is to pull out the coefficients so i pull out the coefficients and then i integrate uh, when I'm integrating, I have uh, simple 1 over f of x and, and, you know, I sort of go on and apply the ln and uh, that's pretty much it. So the linear, um, the partial fraction case 1 is very simple to integrate. A lot of people forget this. Remember that when you're integrating this, this is basic. AS integration, you bring it up, you increase the power divided by the new power. Multiply by the differential of the bracket if there is one and you sort of get your answer. No complications there. Uh, then you would have this. Then I think, you see, I asked you to integrate directly. So what I should first check is whether this is an improper fraction or not. Yes, because there's an x cube in the denominator and an x cube in the numerator as well. So I've separated the constant and then I've done an integration by partial fractions you can see my integration here again integrating this is simple you bring up the power you integrate like you would do in on an as exam and you get your answer this will not become ln x square that's wrong there aren't okay there aren't multiple answers for integration as well there is just one type of integration and the answer will always be the same that other people get okay so that's integration by partial fractions. Some of these questions do get complicated. There was another question on uh, by first expressing this in partial fractions. So this was an improper fraction question. Okay, this is where it got a little complicated. I created the quest this question myself, but this came up in the past papers um, and I looked at that question to create this one. Since this was a more recent one, I didn't want to include it in the, uh, the actual past paper question in the lectures. Uh, so when you have this quadratic factor in the denominator situation uh, where you, you know, separated like that bx plus c over x square plus 4, there is probably the, I, I would say it's always going to be true that at some level you're going to end up with uh, integration by tan inverse. Okay, so look at this expression. x minus 2 over x square plus 4. Now, if the denominator is x squared plus 4, that tells me that tan, tan inverse is going to come in. But right now it cannot come in because there is, a, generally I have a 1 in the numerator or a number in the numerator, but I don't have that. So what I've done here is I've separated the fractions. I've done x over x squared plus 4 and 2 over x squared plus 4. So 2 over x squared plus 4 becomes tan inverse of x over 2 half into half. That's what the tan inverse rule was. This one becomes integration by uh recognition what became when i was um trying to solve integration of just tan inverse of x so remember that this case is there in the past papers frequently tested in the recent ones why because a lot of people got it wrong in the first row that brings us to the complete end of integration that's a long sort of revision for integration that took me about 24 minutes to do that and to be honest that doesn't end there Differential equations is another topic that relies heavily on the idea of your ability to integrate. So when you are doing differential equations, uh, the first step that I tell people is separation of variables. You need to do this correctly. There is often a mark for this. Make sure that you write your separation correctly like I've written in the question. Uh, I've taken y to the other side, written with dy and taken x to the right and kept x to the right hand side and moved the dx on the other side that's called separation of variables you integrate on both sides put a plus c on one side uh, whichever side you want to it doesn't matter which side so just do that i've done lots of questions on this remember that all types of integrations can now be part of your differential equation so you're going to have partial fractions you could have substitutions you could have integration by parts you could have tan inverse you could have recognition you could have simple trigonometry you could have more complicated trigonometry 
Okay, that is a lot of space that has been left out. Okay. So, remember, don't try to, you know, sort of judge on the go that what is going to be an integration of cos square y. You see, you don't have to integrate cos square y, it becomes sec square y. So, once you've completed your separation of variables, that's when you start thinking about your uh, integrations. See, when I did this, I realized that it's integration of ln x. So, I've used i late. Again, that's something that you need to remember. Integration by paths. Okay, so then lots of questions. Uh, remember that when you are separating variables, they don't move to the left and right in a plus minus situation. They're already multiplied or divided. So this entire thing moves to the left hand side so that it becomes 600 over x into 300 minus x. Why did I move it to the left hand side? Because I always want a dx and dt in the numerators. They cannot be in the denominators. So I couldn't have moved to dx to this side and said that this become, becomes 1 over dx. That's wrong. It doesn't get integrated that way. Okay, sometimes it's going to be less obvious that it's integration by parts. Only when you do some factorization will you understand it sine square 2 theta i told you this before it comes up in unusual situations a lot of people end up being confused and you know to sort of do random useless integration so remember your identity it's half minus half cos 4 theta uh, okay all of this all of that Yep, so, okay. Was there a question? Uh, no, I haven't. Is there part two to this? There isn't a part two. Oh, okay, what question am I solving here? I think there's a question from the next page, example 11, yeah. Okay, there was sort of a dearth of uh, space here. Okay, so I go on and integrate this. This is integration by parts. So I go on and integrate this. You can see it up there. I want to show you state what happens to the value of x as t becomes large. So I've integrated all of this. It was a complicated integration. You should pause uh, a few seconds, uh, roll back a few seconds, pause it, solve it, see if you get the correct answer. And. <laughs> Then in part 2 it says, state what happens to the value of x as t becomes large. So, I have gotten this expression. That was my final expression from my integration. So, what happens to the value of x as t becomes large? So, there are two ways of doing it. One is that you could write this entire expression, this entire expression on the calculator, put a very large number for t. What is a very large number? Press 9, 10 times and, and you know, sort of write, overwrite 9 power 9, 9, 9, 9. Sometimes the calculator is going to give you an error, so you need to make the number smaller. So that's what you start doing. You try to make the number smaller because sometimes the calculators have limits in terms of the numbers that they can sort of compute. So uh, what you can do is you can put this entire thing on a calculator and it's going to churn out a final answer. And that's going to be, uh, I don't have a calculator on me right now, but it's going to be cube root of 9. Uh, that's going to be the uh, value of cube root of 9. So it's going to be something like, um, I don't know, or 2 point something, 2.12 or something like that. So the calculator is going to churn out that. So you can, you can say that as t becomes large, so x approaches 2.14 something, whatever the calculator gave you. Or the other way of doing it is to analyze the expression. Now you see your primary variable is t state what happens to the value of x as t grows large so where is t t is in the denominator what happens to t as it grows large it keeps growing larger which means that this fraction keeps getting smaller how small can a fraction be the fraction can be so small that it becomes eventually zero so if this entire thing approaches zero as t becomes large then x should approach cube root of nine that's how you analyze expression. Most often in these questions, you will either have something in the denominator or you will have e power x or e power minus x or something like that. So it's best to simplify the algebra inside first and then sort of analyze the expression. But I'm telling you using a calculator will work in 90% of the cases. So go on and do that if you are unsure 
what to do do that get a final answer you may lose that one mark it's absolutely fine if it was a two mark question but there's a fair chance that you could also get that one mark just by stating that number uh that x is approaching so this can be done with a calculator so that was differential equations where you don't have real life situations then i have another part of differential equations where you have those rate of change questions i do an entire uh sort of uh, marathon on that uh i did that the video is there i would strongly suggest that you go back and watch that there is lots to understand there uh first is constructing these differential equations you see in the previous question the differential was already part of your uh, question but right now in most of these questions what i'm going to tell you is that show that h satisfies the differential equation i'm still going to show it to you but you can also come across questions where you don't have anything to show for example in this question it says write down a differential equation so you got to write something in dv and dt uh describing the situation and if you read this question it is very confusing and solve it to show that now in the same part you have to construct a differential equation integrate it and then come up with a an expression so it's an entire seven mark question in one go if you mess up the first part of it you're pretty much lost on the entire question so that's a straight uh, seven mark hit that you'll come across and not just seven marks the question carries on it has another three plus two so you'll probably lose at you know 10 12 points who knows pause here do this question if you want I'm going to pause on the solution for a bit, pause it again and see the solution. Okay, so not much to explain there. I told you that that's a lot of practice just uh, doing the questions. Then this uh, topic is called numerical solutions to equations. Uh, it's also called iterations where you are trying to find the root or the solution to an equation by doing so what I what you would call trial and error but there's a process called iteration that you try to use uh, using your calculators and you come to the final answer a lot of these questions have very specific parts in terms of how to prove that there's a root so roots can appear as intersection points between two curves so the root of this equation is basically these two equations simultaneously solved when i say simultaneously solved what i'm looking for is the intersection point so i've drawn this curve i've drawn that curve and i've sort of pointed out the intersection point now a lot of people actually ask me is it remember is it necessary to remember all the curves yes it is necessary to remember particularly when you are doing your a2 because uh, one would assume that you already know those curves but if you don't you should go back and rehearse you should know your trigonometry you should know basic algebra how is 1 over x how is 1 over x squared how is e power x how is ln x 1 x cube and so on how are these curves drawn because this chapter will ask you to sort of you know uh, demonstrate that ability so you need to know that then it says show by calculation that the equation has a root between uh, 0 and 1 this is uh, by calculation so how do you show whether a root uh, whether an equation has a root between 0 and 1 you sort of try to solve uh, you plug in the values you say you plug in 0 and you say you get a negative 1 you plug in 1 and you say you get a positive 1 if your y values are crossing from the negative to the positive or from positive to the negative that means the curve is crossing the x-axis so that's what you need to know then uh, again this question verify by calculation one uh, general mistake that i often see is that people quickly go on and plug the values remember that you need to first bring everything to one side and then to create a function so I've brought everything to one side regardless of how you bring it, whether you bring it in the multiplication or division or addition or subtraction. There are a lot of mosquitoes. Uh, so uh, you add, subtract and you know sort of get to your answers. You bring it to one side, create a function, uh, plug in the values and then sort of say that it moves from the negative to the positive or positive to the negative or you just say that change in sign indicates root then this uh says use the iterative formula this so you need to be able to do this iteration process you need to follow the specifics of the question if this uh, question says give the result of each iteration to four decimal places see that i've written all the iterations correct to four decimal places 
to give the uh, find alpha correct to two decimal places so all of these then get rounded to two decimal places when it gets repeated twice you stop and you say that that's the root i've done a third repetition just in case so if it gets repeated twice that should be the end of your iteration if you don't know the iterative process please go back and watch the video on iteration and that should help you okay all of these are then past paper questions lots of questions that i then uh, solve okay um that is where i draw the curves of sin x uh, sec x cos x x and cot x i told you in the earlier video that i do it in a different chapter you need to remember these uh curves they are derived how are they derived basically cos x x is 1 over sin x so if sin x was 1 then cos x x should also be 1 because it's 1 over 1 but if sin x was 0 so 1 over 0 becomes infinity so this has gone to infinity similarly this has gone to negative infinity and so on there are negatives and positives since the sine curve was negative here the cos x curve is also negative here and so on so remember the curves they can get transformed so you could, if, if i had sec 2x it would be shrunk if I had cot 2x, it would also be shrunk. If I have, let's say, sec x plus 2, it would move one unit up. And you would see all those points moving to, plus 1 would move one unit up, plus 2 would move two units up, and so on. They have seen very challenging questions appear on iterations as well. They rely on your ability to do a bit of um, circular measure from AS. So that's something that you need to remember. You need to remember your formulas. You need to remember your trigonometry, basic ones. This is a tough question. If you want to pause here, uh, just pause here, try to see what I've done in order to prove this. Remember that even if you are unable to prove this first part, you can still carry on with the question, do the other five marks correctly. And, and that should be sort of a positive thing for you that you've done most of the question correctly. Don't miss out on the other marks. That's terrible to miss out on everything. Uh, then with numerical solutions to equations, there are other uh, topics being merged together as well. You can have differentiation, you could have uh, integration as well. So those are the topics that you could have. okay uh then that brings us to the end of that topic then the next topic is complex numbers a very long topic i have about nine videos on this topic uh to be honest it's difficult to recap complex numbers but i'm going to try my best to do it right now um and i'm going to go through quick but if you haven't done complex numbers in detail please make sure that you watch the videos in detail uh imaginary numbers or non-real numbers you didn't use a notation called i which is the root of minus one you simplify everything in terms of i so if you have a quadratic equation you know i could ask you to apply the quadratic formula and you know sort of get that answer i apply it here um then i have some rules that says complex letters are often represented with the letter z complex numbers are written in the form x plus yi where x is the real part and yi is the imaginary part those are important ideas because you need to plot them then the axes are real and imaginary axes so you will have to do that as well complex roots always occur in pairs this is true for equations that have all real numbers so if you have an equation that looks like this there are no other i's written in the equation then the, then it's going to always have roots that occur in pairs what do i mean when they occur in pairs you see minus 14 plus 8 and minus 14 minus 8 ignoring the denominator right now but that's something uh, so they always occur in pairs so if i tell you that one of the roots is 2 plus i then you can also automatically say that the other root is going to be 2 minus i and it's called the conjugate of the first root so complex conjugates of each other uh, the roots are complex conjugates of each other conjugates are often represented with the letter z star you can stop here try this question if you want i haven't done this here then powers of i have a pattern your calculator cannot compute this your calculator hmm is i think go up to pi power four so you need to know how the pattern goes on it continues in patterns of four so i could ask you for an i power 99 you would say that uh an i power 99 so if they repeat in patterns of four so i look for the nearest multiple of four i find out that i power 100 remember that all powers of uh, all i all multiples of four 
will end at hundred uh, end at one. So i power four is going to be one. I power eight is going to be one. I power twelve is going to be one. I power sixteen is going to be one. Similarly, i power hundred is also going to be one. I power ninety nine is a term behind that. So i power ninety nine would be the term here. Why? Because they're always repeating in patterns of four. I hope you understand that. If you don't, please go back and watch the detailed videos. Some simplification questions, operation questions. Okay, then uh, a lot of complex number questions are about comparisons. So what you compare is the real part to the real part and imaginary part to the imaginary part. Sometimes you'll end up with simultaneous equations, but that is the comparison that's only valid. You cannot compare anything else. You cannot compare x to x. You, uh, you see this expression has both x to x and x and y's. You cannot compare the x's. You cannot compare the y's. You can compare the real part to the real parts and the imaginary parts to the imaginary parts. The imaginary parts are the ones with i. Okay, some questions. Then there is this growing tendency from the examiner that they don't test polynomials separately. They just put it together with a uh, complex number question. It, tells, it tests a lot of concepts and that's how you uh, get a bigger chunk of the question you find an eight mark question that has both a lot of complex number in it and you and that sort of polynomials in it as well the best strategy that works when you are doing uh this is comparison this is a relatively simple simpler question uh but you should stop here and see what i've done uh when you have let's say a question like this and you are trying to find the other roots the best strategy that works is comparison remember that your first objective should be to you know so, sort of simplify your complex roots and try to construct an equation out of that and then sort of get going why because if you leave an i in the equation that makes it very complicated you can also have simultaneous equations in uh, complex number remember that in this question for example your objective is to find u and v not i so don't make i the subject of the equation it's going to be useless why because i itself is a number you're not doing any favors to anyone by you know making i the subject it's useless now equations such as these are also uh, sort of solved with the quadratic formula or, or with uh, depending on the question but they will not have roots that are complex conjugates of each other. Then I've seen a lot of people mess this up. You cannot do this with a calculator. You have to do this manually. Okay, calculator probably won't even be able to figure this out. But when I ask you for the complex roots of any number, what I'm asking you to do is a huge sort of comparison. I say the square root of seven minus 24 I is equals to a plus B I the ones written in black. Then I put squares on both sides and I've done a comparison. The real parts with the real parts, imaginary parts with the imaginary parts. I end up with two sets of equations that I go on and then solve simultaneously. That's done on the right hand side. If you've never done this before, I would strongly suggest that you do this right now. Then representing complex numbers geometrically, they are representing on something that we call argon diagrams. You will be asked to draw argon diagrams on the exam. Make sure that you draw it with a proper pencil and ruler and with proper measurements for the axis don't draw a random axis don't draw a freehand line if you don't have a scale and a pencil and a compass and a d with you you will probably lose out marks there are no marks for drawing random diagrams on the exam you will be given an empty space or a line space it depends on the examiner and you will have to draw an argon diagram an argon diagram is basically an x and y axis but the y axis is imaginary and the x axis is real so you plot the real components and the imaginary components i often tell my students that i have basically plotted three comma two it just that it means something else but you should also be able to you know translate complex numbers into a coordinate geometry and b vectors that should help you solve a lot of questions conjugates are basically reflections uh there are two things about complex numbers one is modulus and the other is argument modulus is the distance from the origin and argument is the angle that it makes with the positive x-axis there are rules for arguments those are the rules so if you don't know the rules make sure that you know make sure that you sort of revise for arguments it's necessary that you first find out what quadrant your complex number lies in and then only can you can come up with a value for the argument 
um again alpha is calculated tan inverse of y over x there's often this question whether arguments should be in uh degrees or they should be in radians to be honest the examiner doesn't differentiate between the two but ideally they should be in radians because often the question will tell you something like this uh where should i say that is uh i was going to say between minus pi and pi it's written somewhere in one of the questions so you will have that then there are two other forms of the complex number one is the polar form that's also called the modulus argument form so uh you write the complex number in the form r cross theta plus r sine theta iota where theta is the argument r is the modulus if you plug in those numbers and you put it on a calculator and you compute that you will probably and you if you write it like that and then you put it on a calculator and compute that you will end up with whatever complex number you started off with uh okay so polar coordinates comes from the polar form of the coordinate system a polar coordinate form is basically r and theta again explained in detail in the uh lecture videos there is the exponential form which is r e iota theta uh again it has the same applications so you could be asked to convert from one form to the other and so on Geometrical interpretations again important uh, when you end up add up to complex numbers It's basically something that happens in vectors that you end up creating a parallelogram It has implications in terms of modulus and argument You can do away with that the most important thing that I want to point out here is that multiplying a complex number z by the imaginary number i is geometrically equivalent to rotating in 90 degrees clock anti-clockwise about the origin Okay, so that is an important application. Remember that Similarly, if you multiply it with i, uh, if you multiply it with minus i, it's the, the equivalent is 90 degrees clockwise rotation. So those are two things that you remember. There is one question that starts like that. Then you have these rules for modulus and arguments that you can, uh, that are used for proving a lot of questions. And those are uh, important questions. Just make sure that you understand the rules that when two complex numbers are being divided, their modulus is also being divided and their argument is being subtracted. Uh, when two complex numbers are being multiplied, their modulus is being multiplied, but their arguments is added. Uh, there is this question that I haven't solved, but I solved this one, I think. I don't know some questions the ones with where, where you asked to improve the tan inverse of 4 over 3 and something like that I don't know where that question is let me look for it yeah this one this last part actually solves with the rules so that's where I solved it I can move back to the question pause it here do this question and then you can look at this solution and you know sort of understand what how those rules work okay that's the end of uh, the first part of complex numbers the second part of complex numbers is about loci um the locus of complex numbers there are three different types of loci one is circles the other is perpendicular bisectors and the third is called a half line you should know when to draw each uh, complex numbers there are uh, lots of videos on that please make sure that you go on and watch this it often comes up with a pinch of complicated trigonometry, although it's just two marks, but you need to apply all that trigonometry that you learn at O levels and finding cosine rules and sine rules and so on. So that can also come up here. Uh, remember when to draw a circle when there's a modulus on one side and a number on the other, when you have modulus on both sides, you end up drawing a perpendicular bisector. And when you have argument of Z equals to something, then you end up drawing a half line half lines are the trickiest because it's uh, something that you haven't seen half lines have a starting point and then an angle that angle represents uh, arguments so it can be in the positive side or in the negative cycle as well depending on what the question looks like okay again i've done questions on this some do get very complicated so please make sure that you go and watch the videos if you don't know this already if you have questions you can ask me those questions in the comments or on my instagram okay then the last chapter is vectors so vectors is something that you learn at o level you learn two dimensional vectors at o level if you've done add math 
if you would have done uh, you would have done vectors in a lot more detail to be honest this vectors doesn't overlap with either of them uh, it's just that the representation is there and you sort of need to come up with the same kind of operations so not going into detail on basic vectors but addition and subtraction of vectors that's simple in the column vector form okay there is this cartesian form uh, that's new but i honestly don't use that form i find it more comfortable to express everything as a column vector and then you know add subtract multiply whatever i need to okay the first thing is parallel vectors parallel vectors are vectors that uh, are scalar multiples of each other the direction can be completely opposite the size can be opposite uh, different it's just that there uh they are multiples of each other and in whatever way they could be multiples in terms of um, what the multiple could be minus 2 or 2 or 0 0.5 or 0 0.25 or 0 0.1 whatever the case may be there is this dot product of vectors where you multiply the x coordinates y coordinates and z coordinates and you add them up together right now the 16 on your screen doesn't mean anything it comes up you it is used in proving something the first thing that it proves is, proves is for perpendicular vectors for perpendicular vectors the dot product is zero then you have something called magnitude of a vector that's the length there's a formula you can see it on the screen then there's unit vector unit vectors are vectors with magnitude one and they sort of you know match the direction with the original vector that was used to calculate the unit vector so they're in the same direction as the original vector angles between vectors are dot product over the product of their magnitudes equals to cos theta uh, remember that I can ask you for a, a obtuse or acute uh, depending on the question. I don't ask, in fact, cos theta, may, it doesn't matter. Uh, acute or obtuse, it doesn't matter. Sin theta, may matter. Okay. okay. Then, uh, position vectors are vectors defined with uh, reference to uh, O as the starting point. So, any set of coordinates can be converted into a position vector. So, P has coordinates X, Y, Z, so it can be converted into OP. Then there's something that I teach called breaking down vectors. What is breaking down vectors? You see AB can be broken down to OB minus OA and CD can be broken down into CD my, uh, OD minus OC and so on. One thing that I've forgotten to explain is that when you have an angle in this form, you start from the center, you move to the left and you move to the right. Those are the two vectors that you take a dot product of. So you need to remember that, that you need to take those two vectors uh, starting from the middle and going to the left and right. Then I could have um, basic questions on parallelograms, trapeziums, and so on. 3D questions are somewhat interesting. They ask you to travel along a set of lines and, you know, sort of reach coordinates. I hope everybody's done these questions before. Uh, not, not much to explain unless you are doing a question. Again, sort of a question. Okay, a lot of these questions are from P1. Why? Because vectors was previously part of P1 and P3 both. Now it's moved from P1 to P3. And a large chunk of P3 got moved to further math. So you have a relatively simpler uh, situation. So if you come across questions that ask you to, you know, sort of uh, older past papers will ask you to find the equation of a plane or distance from a plane. Remember that um, the part about planes has moved to further maths. It's no longer in your syllabus. Okay, that's vectors part one. That was the part that you did in AS. Then the part in A2 is actually about... About vector equations of lines. Like you had the equation of a straight line, which was y equals to mx plus c. The vector equation of a line is a plus lambda v. Lambda is just a variable. It could uh, be replaced with mu. It could be replaced with s. It could be replaced with t. There are lots of variables that the examiner uses um so like in you know in y equals to mx plus c you would find m and then you're trying to find c similarly in this case you need to find a and b b is the directional vector and a is any point on the line this is an entire concept that you need to understand i cannot probably do it in a recap video if you don't know the concept please go back and watch it uh but then i can then uh, explain to you what the operations on those lines would be then sort of two lines are parallel when their directional vectors are parallel what do i mean by parallel again they are scalar multiples of each other so they don't need to be exactly the same they can just be multiples of each other and i can say that the vectors are the lines are parallel when two lines intersect what i have to do is i have to solve their equations simultaneously so i've taken both equations converted them into general coordinates and you know sort of equated them and tried to find 
a common point between them since i have a set of three equations i just need two to solve simultaneously the third is used to verify that those values are valid or not at times you will not have the third value balancing that is when we say that these lines are skew so they are neither intersecting nor they are parallel uh, so those are skew lines how do you determine them it's the same process as the intersection it's just that the third coordinate won't balance if the third coordinate doesn't balance then the lines are skew angle between two lines cos theta equals to b1 dot b2 over modulus of b1 and modulus of b2 then this probably is the most challenging part of vector that a lot of people keep asking me there is a 20 minute video on this please go to the channel and watch this where i do this question in a lot of detail it's, it's important to understand the process once you understand the process it's about replicating the process wherever you come across a question about a perpendicular line from a, a perpendicular line from a point to a line a perpendicular distance from a point to a line or, or the foot of the perpendicular so all of that is there uh, in that video it's a detailed process you need to understand the process it's probably can't be recapped that brings us to the end of the syllabus i hope this was productive for you please make sure that when you're going to the exam uh, you take your compass pencil d etc uh, you need to have your instruments ready um, about p3 remember that there will be some challenging parts to the questions the trick is to keep the questions going don't stop and you know just go crazy over a question let's say you come across an identity that you can't seem to prove just skip over it go to the next question you will find easier questions you will find more difficult questions and that should work out in your favor remember that set yourself realistic targets in terms of scoring you no one can go on and score a 75 or 75 you know sort of in the first go unless you're a genius in which case you should try to do that if you you know sort of haven't done 20 years of past papers and uh, you're not a genius either then you should probably give yourself some margin give yourself some marks that you can leave out seven eight marks it's absolutely fine you can come back to it at the end of the exam try to do as much as you can i showed you right now questions in iteration for example if you're unable to solve the first part do the other two parts correctly and you get a five out of eight which is a very good number to get in one question some questions you'll get completely right partial fractions binomial expansions modulus functions polynomials simple complex numbers uh, integration basic integration uh, plain and simple integration by parts all those are easy parts so not the entire paper won't be difficult there will be parts that will be difficult the important thing is is the psychological part where you you know sort of convince yourself that leaving out a few marks is not going to take me down to a d or an e it's going to take me down um it's not even probably going to take me down below an a star but uh if even if you end up scoring let's say 70 you will probably end up scoring an a star so uh give yourself that five mark six mark seven mark eight mark margin which is absolutely fine to have okay thank you please subscribe for uh more videos